everybody doing? We're really glad that you're here. So, and by the way, this band, can I just say that? Wow, these guys are so good. And um, listen, I, I speak in a lot of different places. I hear a lot of bands. Some of them are terrible. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus. It doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love them. It just means I don't like them. And, uh, but these guys, it, and I'm not just saying that because my son is the one who sang the first song, by the way. Wow. Kid's got a special call in his life. And um, so anyway, um, about seven years ago, I was awoken by my wife, and at the time, my seven-year-old son, and, uh, because they had heard something in the house that shouldn't have been heard, whatever that was. So I wake up, I get out of bed, I grab my phone, because apparently that's what you do. There's a burglar in this house, I'm going to threaten to put his picture on Instagram if he doesn't leave. And, um, but, and, and at the time, I was in the middle of this um, like cold sinus thing I had going on, so I felt terrible. I walked into my office at home and I heard like uh, this scratching behind the book, my, my, my bookcase. And now you got to understand something about the construction of our old house is the people who owned the house before us redid the entire kitchen. It looked beautiful. We were so grateful that they redid it for us. And, um, but the way that they did it was that there was, a, there was this hood for the stove, but they didn't want it to go all the way up. Instead, so what they did was they put in a flex pipe, so it kind of goes up, and then it went into the wall, and then went up and out of the house. But the problem is when you put it into the wall, right behind the kitchen was where my office was. You, they had built in some shelves, and you could see the flex pipe from that side. And so they didn't really care so much about that. So what I did when we moved in is I put a bunch of books up that, to cover the majority of the flex pipe. So anyway, so I, I'm, I'm hearing the scratching, I'm taking books down, and then I hear the scratching is coming from inside the flex pipe. So like a typical man, um, I just grabbed the broom and hit the flex pipe, and whatever was scratching in there, I may have, must have like knocked it unconscious because this, it stopped. And, um, and then, I, I get, I, even though I wasn't feeling well, I had a million things to do at church, so I get ready and I'm driving to... Um, to church, but before I left, I noticed that there was a little hole in the flex pipe, and I realized, like, I must have poked it when I hit it with the broom. So I tell Carrie, I'm like, look, I'm going to go to church and do what I need to. On the way home, I'll stop at Home Depot and get that aluminum tape to cover up the hole. Well, anyway, I'm literally parking, and at that time, I parked in the back, and because um, there's a door that leads to my office. I call it the Bat Cave entrance. So anyway, so I was kind of right about to go into the Bat Cave, and um, I get a uh, my wife calls me and says, hey, you didn't puncture, you didn't make the hole in the flex pipe. It was a rat, and it's loose in our house. And so now it's on. And so I'm like, I'll be home in 10 minutes. So I get in the car, and I drive home, and she says to me, okay, so the, um, I saw the rat, and it, it came down from the, the bookcases, and it ran down the hall, and it's in Livy's room. So my daughter, Olivia, was about five at the time. And so I go in, I get a storage bin, and I get a broom. And because um, what I'm going to do is just catch it, sweep it, and then bring it back to its natural habitat. And then so what I do is I get in there, and then my son is seven. He gets in there with his own storage bin and broom, and I close the door behind us. And I'm like, Zan, out of the three creatures in this room, only two of us are leaving. And so... I don't know which two of the three, but only two of us are leaving. And so one is going to be caught and then dealt with. And so anyway, so <clears throat> I look, I'm moving things around, and I see that the rat is inside Livy's closet. So I, I see it, and I try to sweep it out, but it runs across the room under her dresser. So I move the dresser, and then when I move under the dresser, it runs under the bed. So I move the bed, and then it knows. It's running for the door. But because rats are dumb, they don't know that the door is closed. And so it, go, it goes under the door, and be also because I have the reflexes of a cheetah, um, I saw that thing, boom, and I hit it to stop it uh, from getting to the door. It was stunned. But then um, it tried to make a move again, and I whacked it again to stop it. Apparently that was one whack too many, because then the rat went to rat heaven, which I believe is also called the magic kingdom. But anyway, um, so then I've got another problem, which is I got to scoop this thing up and then deal with, you know, 
dead animals and whatnot. And, I, and by the way, I feel terrible. And I, I just, and I, I get done and I tell Carrie, um, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I feel terrible. I'm done. Wake me up tomorrow. And uh, that was, and that, I don't know if you had that moment. And then my daughter Livy walked into her room and she's like, look what the rat did. It moved all my furniture. I'm like, that's right. That was the rat. And um, now, I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you just say to the day, like, today you won. We'll pick this up tomorrow. And uh, I think we've all, we've all had moments where we want to quit. And I've found that if you want to quit, there will never be a shortage of excuses to quit. And there's always going to be things to blame. There's always going to be people who are less than helpful. And there's always going to be circumstances that aren't quite ideal. But the other thing I've noticed is that people who achieve their goals, couples who get through difficult seasons and make it, and believers who fulfill their calling uh, always find reasons not to quit. Instead, they just keep going and they succeed. Now, I'm telling you this because we have arrived at the end. We are after 11 months and 37 messages later. We are at the end of our series in the book of Acts. And the last thing that we saw, Paul survives a shipwreck uh, on his way to Rome. But by the way, he's not in Rome yet. He's actually about 425 miles away from Rome. And no matter um, what is thrown at him, and this is the thing as I continue to read the book of Acts that I'm so amazed by, no matter what is thrown at this guy, he refuses to give up. He refuses to give up because he's a person with God's call on his life, and he will not stop until that calling is fulfilled. And that calling for him was preaching the gospel in the city of Rome. And this should encourage us, because if you're in a place where you say, Pastor, I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm experiencing opposition. Well, guess what? Good for you. That means you're doing something of significance if you're, if you're experiencing opposition. And maybe you're here and you're, you're kind of on the other side of it. You're, you're, you say, Pastor, I, I want to do something significant, but I always find myself starting and then quitting for some reason. Well, we're going to talk about that as well. And we're going to talk about what it takes to take heart, have courage, and stop giving up and see God fulfill what he wants to do in your life. So we're going to start in Acts 28. We're going to start in uh, verse 1. Here's what we read. It says, Now, when they had escaped, they uh, they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. Now, when Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on a fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hands. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, uh, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice will not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked a long time and saw that no harm came on him, they changed their mind and saw and, and, and said he was a god. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius and who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. But Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So when he, this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. So if you pause there and give me your attention, there's three things we're going to look at about not giving up. The first is this, if you're a note taker, and that is don't make temporary setbacks permanent. Now, let me give you a little bit of background so that you understand what it is that's happening here. Um, They're on an island that's called Malta. We're going to look at it for a second, in a second. And uh, snakes were a huge problem on Malta. Uh, now they've been eradicated, but back then, all around the Mediterranean basin, uh, there, was, there was a huge snake problem. Now, the reason why this is significant is because in verse 4, when the Maltese people see, now remember what's happened. In chapter 27, there's been a shipwreck. Then all these people come to shore. It's 276 people that were on board this ship that was destroyed right at the shore of their island. They get there. All these people, they see Roman soldiers with a whole bunch of prisoners. And in their minds, once again, they they were believers in the Greek gods. And so they saw a shipwreck as that's the judgment of the gods on on these people. But then they see that the snake 
attaches itself to Paul, they say, justice won't allow him to live. Now, um, I, I teach out of the New King James uh, Version. It's my favorite translation, which is why I teach out of it. But I will tell you something that the New King James does not do that the newer translations do. And that is, they don't, it doesn't capitalize the J in justice, which the newer translations are right in this regard. Because while the translation of the word is correct, the, the word is decay um, in Greek, which is translated justice, that's correct. What they didn't realize is that it's actually a proper name, which is why it should be um, capitalized. DK was the name of the goddess of justice in the Greek pantheon of gods. DK was the daughter of Zeus, was the goddess of justice who watched over humanity and dispensed justice on those who were uh, lawbreakers or committing evil. And uh, she's depicted as a young woman holding scales in her hand with a sword. In fact, we have a, a depiction of her. Now, I want you to notice that her eyes are open because she's watching humanity. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that the Romans adopted the Greek gods. But because the Romans didn't speak Greek, they spoke Latin, they um, changed the names to give them Latin names. So Zeus became Jupiter, so Ares became Mars, so DK, this girl, um, becomes Astria, um, is, is her name. And then they changed her a little bit. If we see the picture, this is a statue um, that's found. And they added the blindfold. And so she's still dispensing justice, but now... Um, she, and by the way, you see that there's snakes here, that she's in control of them. Um, but it's, it's because there, it was in the Roman style of governing is that justice was blind. If you ever go into a courthouse, you'll see a picture like this. This is, um, finds its way in, it's from Greek mythology. Anyway, now, um, the people, now I want you to think about this from the perspective of the people. The people worship the goddess. And by the way, they worship the goddess um, DK in, uh, on Malta. And then they see these guys that come from a shipwreck, prisoners. And they're like, yeah, surely these people are guilty because they, they were shipwrecked. Then um, they see Paul and Paul now is getting bit by a snake. And they're like, and they're like surely this guy's a murderer. Now he doesn't die. He survives the snake bite. And then the people say, okay, if this guy survives the snake bite, which means the goddess was trying to kill him, if he doesn't die, then he's more powerful than the goddess, and that means that he is a god himself. That's how they go from this man is a murderer to this guy is a god. That's how the, you know, and I know it's a pretty far swing, but that's actually what they thought, that he was even more powerful. Now, but I want you to think about this, and this is important. Um, if you live your life based on what other people think, am I a murderer? Am I a god? Am I somewhere in between? I mean, you'll never get any, you'll never accomplish anything in your life if you're going by what other people think. I want you to also notice that Paul isn't stopping. Nothing. I'm telling you, if we were going somewhere and we got into a shipwreck, we'd be like, God doesn't want me to go. I mean, look what happened. If we were going somewhere and we got bit by a snake, we'd be like, forget it. God doesn't want me to go. Um, if we got, if both happened, we'd be for sure God doesn't want me to go. And sometimes, listen, um, but Paul's not stopping. There is nothing that's going to stop this guy from doing the thing that God has called him to do. And sometimes we have that general, um, you know, disposition on stuff that's not really that important. And I've noticed that in my own life, that sometimes I'm so deeply committed to things that don't matter. And then the things that do matter, I'm like, well, maybe, you know. So about a year ago, it was, it was a Sunday, um, a year ago or so, I decided to take an off day from my eating plan. I don't like to use the word cheat day. I don't like being associated with the word cheating. Um, probably because I'm a New England Patriots fan. We like to keep things on the up and up. And, uh, <laughs> And so anyway, but I took the day off. And the reason I took the day off is because I wanted Reese's Pieces. That's really all that I wanted. And um, this is the greatest candy that's ever made, as far as I'm concerned. It's the, if you've never had Reese's Pieces, maybe you just got here from Cuba. You've never had Reese's Pieces. Let me explain to you what you've been missing, what they don't have on the island. And um, Reese's Pieces is, imagine M&M's, but they're filled with peanut butter, which just makes them even better. And I know that M&M's tried to make one with peanut butter. That's just hot trash, what they put out. Reese's Pieces is where it's at. That is my go-to movie candy. It's my go-to movie at home candy. It's my go-to driving candy. It's pretty much, it's my go-to eating in the doctor's office candy. Anyway, it's what I eat when I'm in places. So anyway, but that's what I wanted. The problem is, and I have, I keep in my house a secret stash of Reese's Pieces that only I know the whereabouts of. My problem is, is that one day through the course of discovery, um, uh, my kids found my two youngest kids found my secret stash and totally wiped me out. You can imagine the rage. Um, so, I tell, so after church, I tell my wife, 
hey, I'm going to stop at the store uh, on the way home because I know there's a few things that we were going to pick up. So I'll just pick those up for you. And she's like, Bob, it's after church. You're tired. You haven't eaten anything. Let's just, let's just, we'll get it. We'll go tomorrow or something. And I'm like, Carrie, it's my pleasure. (laughs) And we shouldn't put things off for tomorrow. That could be done today. And um, so anyway, I drive to Publix and um, I drive there and they are sold out of Reese's Pieces. And now I'm in a weird position. Now I got to pick up all this dumb stuff that I said I was going to (laughs) get when I didn't even get the thing that I actually wanted. So now... And some of the stuff my wife wanted was frozen foods. And so now I'm grabbing the frozen foods and the other things. And then, um, and I'm driving. And you know what? You know what? There's a reason why everyone shops a certain way so you get the frozen foods last. Because you're on the clock when you have frozen foods because you got to get home. Well, anyway, so, but now I haven't gotten the one thing I wanted. So I have to make an emergency stop at Walgreens. And so I stop at Walgreens. I go in. And uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the candy aisle at Walgreens. And uh, I may have memorized a few SKU numbers. That's not really the point of the story. And, um, but I get to the Walgreens uh, aisle, uh, the candy aisle. I grab two bags, one for now and one for a new secret stash that I will start that no one will know about because it will be under lock and key. I get to, to the line. The line is super long, and there's only one guy working. I finally get to the front, and I'm like, hey, man, this is all I want. How much is it? And the guy's like, whoa, whoa. Sl- hold on, bro do you have a Walgreens reward card? And I'm like, sir, it is the year of our Lord, 2023. Is it possible for a person to just buy two items without getting sucked into another reward situation? Well, the answer to that question is no. So I ended up signing up real quick because truth be told, it wasn't a bad offer. And uh, so then I'm now driving home. My wife's asking me, like, why have you been gone for an hour? And why is all the frozen stuff in weird shapes? Uh, Because it was in the trunk for quite some time. And I'm like, honey, I don't know. I I guess I got it before I was done shopping. And um, because I didn't tell her about the other place. Because I didn't want to reveal my true motives. And that's really the point. And, uh, and, and, And I'm just telling you, listen, if we would seek God as seriously as we seek out our snacks, there would be a transformation that took place. I'm telling you, we'd get to where God is leading us. But we've got to develop a, a, just a, a, a desire to just, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes to do what it is that I'm supposed to. But the only thing I'm not going to do is give up. Why? Because everything that you want in your life is on the other side of not giving up. And so whether that's when it comes to your health or your career or your relationships, um, you just don't, don't give up. Why? Because there's two types of pain, and you get to decide which kind of pain you want. Either the pain of discipline to reach your goal, or the pain of regret because you gave up. But we get to decide. And listen, and I'd say this in regards to marriage, because I think a lot of times we give up not realizing that if you don't give up, things really do get better. I have a friend named Mark Gunger, uh, who's a pretty well-known author, and he's spoken at our He's spoken at our marriage retreat a couple of times, and so I've gotten to know him a little bit. And we were at lunch one day, and he was telling me the story of his parents, which has got to be one of the funniest stories I've ever heard, because he was telling me that his parents, they were married for like 60 years, and they hated each other. And it's like, we, they stayed together because you're supposed to stay, but like we're going to stay in this marriage if it kills us. And uh, so that was kind of this general thing. They hated each other. They barely spoke. And uh, they had all these reasons as to why all this resentment built up as to why they didn't like each other. And then one of them got dementia. And, um, and then the other got dementia. And you know what's crazy about all this is that in the process of them getting dementia, they forgot why they were so mad. And they spent the last 15 years of their marriage madly in love. And it just goes through, it's a lesson in not giving up. And it's also a lesson that losing your mind is not the worst thing that could happen. (laughs) So, you know, just just a thought. So, now, I'll tell you, I forgot to use the map. I said I was going to use the map, but I forgot. All right, let um, let me use the map real quick. Okay, so they're here in Malta. This is, uh, if you guys don't know, this is where the Latin beverage was created. And um, Irombed was created around here and Jupina right around here. So anyway, so so they're going to leave Malta. They're going to go to this island, uh, this city off uh, Sicily that's called Syracuse. They're going to make it to Regium, which is at the very tip of Italy, and then they're going to make it to uh, Petuli. Uh, Pompeii is not far from there. Pompeii is going to have a little bit of a situation a few years from now. Um, If you don't know about what happened in Pompeii, you should read about it, around 79. That's what you're looking for. And then from... um, 
Patuli, they're making their way up. They get to the AP Forum and three Tavers, and that's about 30 miles from Rome. And so as we read this next section, they're going to make this whole trek, and then they'll get to uh, Rome. So let's, read, let's start reading from verse 11, where it says this, After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the, three twin, or was the twin brothers. Uh, three twins is a type of ice cream, by the way, which is my favorite type of ice cream. That's a different sermon. Uh, but it's the twin brothers uh, which had wintered at the island. So this ship from Alexandria and Egypt, remember we talked about this last time, that most of the grain that was in Rome was from Egypt. And so they had spent the winter in Malta waiting for the winds to get better and the sea to get better. So, okay, so that's what happens. They had wintered on the island, so they pick up that ship. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled and reached Regium. That was a city that's right at the very southern tip of um, Italy. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we came to Pitoli, where we found brethren and where uh, and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as AP Forum and three inns, or three taverns, as it's also called. Um, when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to the men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem in the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, but there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And then they said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who uh, came reported or spoke any evil of you. But we desired to hear from you uh, what you think for concerning this sect, that is Christians, um, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. And if you pause there and give me your attention, the first thing we said was don't make temporary setbacks permanent. The second thing about not giving up is don't make perceptions your reality. Now, first thing is they leave uh, Paul and the gang, they leave Malta on a ship, an Alexandrian ship, whose figurehead, that is the front of the ship, was the twin brothers. The twin brothers' names are Castor and Pollux. They are the sons of Zeus. In fact, there are statues of them uh, that exist. So they were uh, the patrons of navigation, and apparently they were also the original Abercrombie and Fitch models. And so they had that going for them. And um, thank you for moving those weirdos. And um, Oh, I didn't mention this. Let me say this real quick. Um, over the three months that Paul and the gang spent at Malta, a church was established. Now, we don't know this from the text. We actually know this from uh, church history that records that it was actually Publius, whose father was healed of dysentery. Publius becomes the pastor of the church at Malta. And to this day, the largest church uh, in Malta is called uh, the Church of St. Publius. Now, um, they're headed towards, uh, I showed you the map, that they were headed towards Rome. They finally get to Rome, and I want you to notice, uh, we said in verse 16, that um, Paul was delivered to Rome, but he did, they didn't put him in prison. Instead, instead, they put him in a house where he could live by himself with the soldier that was guarding him. The reason they didn't put him in prison is because there were no formal charges against him, so they allowed him to live in a house, and then people could receive him. What he does when he gets to the house is that after a few days, he calls for the leaders of um, the, the Jewish people in Rome. And he's like, guys, maybe there's been a letter that's been sent about me um, or people came up to tell you. But, and then he kind of lays out that it's like, look, I'm in this chain, not because um, I've done anything wrong, but because I had to appeal to Caesar because I just have the hope of the resurrection. And, um, I, you know, they lay out this whole thing and then they, they, they say, uh, hey, sorry, we appreciate that, Paul, but we've never heard of you. And uh, like, what? You've never heard of me? And no, he didn't say that. But what he does is he just acknowledges that, remember, it's winter. You can't travel in the winter. So even a letter that they wanted to get out or witnesses that they wanted to send, it's just going to be difficult to get them from uh, the area of Judea 
to Rome during, during that time. And, and so, and it creates an amazing opportunity then for Paul to share the gospel. But let me tell you what sometimes happens for us, is that sometimes we, we have a uh, perception of something that's going on, but it just isn't quite accurate. And, and let me tell you what, what happens a lot of times. What immature people do when they see a situation is that they either jump to conclusions, they assume ill will, or they fill in the missing pieces with bad intentions. Here's what mature people do. They just wait and see what happens. And most of the time, um, when we don't have all the information, time will tell what it is that happens. We learn a whole bunch more, and it usually colors in what's taking place much better. And I'll tell you, um, years ago, I was, with, I was at Epcot with my wife and my daughter, Mia, who was maybe two at the time, and uh, maybe a little younger. And so my favorite attraction at um, in the, all the Disney parks is the American Adventure at Epcot. That's my favorite thing. Um, I love it. I, I love going there. I love, uh, I love the song, the acapella, like all those Americana songs that they sing beforehand. I love the show that they do. I, I, that song, you know, America, spread your golden wings. I mean, I, I, I'm so into that. I cry every time I hear it. I got, I got teary-eyed right now just singing it. And um, so, and listen, I know it's in vogue to hate America, but I'm going to tell you, my dad taught me to love America um, because it's the place that my family got refuge from a brutal regime and allowed uh, my family to build a life here. And uh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to live here. Now, because it's such a powerful presentation, the announcer at the American Adventure says, and please, no distractions and no flash photography. And between the announcer, the security that's there, and me, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. Not on my watch. So anyway, and so, but while we were there that day, there was this uh, family that was like two rows in front. And the, the, um, the kids were totally out of control. The lady was taking flash picture, flash photography the whole time. And I'm like, ahem, you know, you ever do one of those, like clearing it? Ahem, you know, I did a few of those. She had no idea how hard I was judging her from two rows back. And, uh, but, I, but I was. And um, then we get to, the, the show ends. And they're like, we'd like to thank you for visiting the American Adventure and ha- enjoy your day at, at, at Epcot. And, um, and, I, and I stand up and I'm like, people are so disrespectful. And uh, they're taking pictures during the show. And I say that loud enough. Totally passive aggressive of me. And, um, but I, I, was, I was, you know, old Bob had problems. He is not the delight that stands before you now. So, and uh, <laughs> now, so, but she didn't, she didn't even flinch when I said that. So when I saw that, I'm like, oh, I need to say it again and louder and closer because that's what a person with like emotional problems does. So I get a little closer and I'm like, Ahem, you know, and I do my whole thing. And, uh, and then as I got closer, uh, her whole family was speaking Portuguese. And I had this like, oh, she doesn't speak English. <laughs> she didn't understand the announcer. She didn't even know America spread your golden. She didn't even know what that means. And, 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 and let me tell you, what, what were we doing? Now, when I say we, see how I just brought us all into what I was doing? <laughs> it just feels better when it's all of us. And uh, no, but let me tell you what I was doing. I was ascribing motives to someone I didn't know, to a situation I didn't understand, and I was totally wrong. And that's almost always the case when we ascribe motives to a situation that we have an incomplete picture of. Uh, Have you ever had someone read a text to you that you sent them, but they add their own inflection to it? (laughs) Oh, Jesus, take the wheel. Uh, That makes me crazy. And uh, like, and, like, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, hi, I'm, oh, hi, how are you? I'm like, that's not what I wrote. <laughs> and I had, this is not, this is a true story. I had like a major disagreement with one of the lunatics I'm related to um, <laughs> because they misread a text that I sent them. And um, they started this whole argument with me. And they were like, you know, thinking that I was insulting them when I reached out to them because I was very concerned about them. Um, and and so I was like, and they came back, they came back hard. And, and I just, I'm like, you know what's going to solve this? A phone call. I call them. And I'm like, what is your deal? And uh, they're like, well, I can't believe you. And I'm like, you know what I want you to do? I want you to read the text out loud to me. And then they're like, well, okay. And I'm like, no, 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 no inflection. Read it like a robot. Hello, Bob. Welcome to. No, we're going to read it like a robot. And then, so they, so they did. And then they're like, oh, I misunderstood what you wrote. Bob, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, it's okay. 
I'm sorry that we're related. <laughs> I didn't say that. Old Bob, passive aggressive Bob, he would have said that. Delightful Bob wouldn't say it. He thinks it, but he won't say it, and that's totally different. So, but isn't it amazing how assumptions are just like this runaway train that just makes the situation worse? Wise is the person who withholds judgment and says, I'm going to wait and see how this whole thing plays out. Um, there is a quote that I heard when I was a million years ago when I was doing my undergrad. Um, I heard this quote, and I've tried to live by it, that says, patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. Patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. Things are revealed in time. Everybody can look good for 15 minutes. Give it some time, and you're going to see what, real, what the real character is. And you know, the great thing is, is that if you're patient before casting judgment, people will think you're as wise as Solomon when all you're doing is allowing patience to do its work. And uh, Solomon writes this in Proverbs 17, verse 28. I put it in your notes. It says, Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouths shut, they seem intelligent. Because you're just taking a wait and see. Well, look what happens. They say, Paul, we haven't heard of you, but we'd like to hear what you say about Christians. And so he says this in verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, go to, hear this, go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their heart and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that sal the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and a great dispute had a great dispute among themselves. And if you pause there and give me your attention, last thing, don't miss the hidden purpose. Sometimes there is a delay, there's a roadblock, and there is a hidden purpose that God has for what's going on here. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. Um, the Jews in Rome wanted to hear Paul because they said that the sect of Christians had been spoken uh, against everywhere. That's in verse 22. Now, a few years earlier in the city of Rome, Caesar Claudius, who was the predecessor to the current Caesar at this time, who was Nero, um, he had kicked all of the Jews out of the city of Rome because there was a conflict over, once again, this is what um, Roman history tells us, that the, the Caesar had a conflict over someone named Crestus. And the majority of scholars, both Christian and non-Christian, believe that Crestus is a reference to Jesus Crestus, Jesus Christ. And um, it's during this time that um, these Jews are sent out and that uh, Paul meets a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, who were from Rome, who had come to Corinth. In fact, in Acts chapter 18, we talked about this. It said this, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came to them. So let's talk about Claudius kicking out Jews from Rome who were Christians. This was true throughout the entire empire, but it was certainly true in Rome that you had to say, Caesar is Lord. Well, this became a problem for Christians because they didn't believe that Caesar is Lord. They believed that Jesus is Lord. And that posed a political situation for um, the believers who were, who, were in, who were there. And so, listen, and this, is, this can make its way. And let me tell you something. We are in an election year, and you can be sure that there will be a struggle between the Caesar is Lord people and the Jesus is Lord people. And um, every time, you know, whenever some, a Christian comes up to me and wants to ask questions, I'm just, you know, I just want you to know I'm a Republican Christian, or I'm a Democrat Christian. I always think, like, you're a Christian who doesn't get it. Um, because Christianity doesn't need an adjective to modify what it is. Um, whenever someone tells me that, and, and once again, I don't think that they're saying it with ill intent, 
But whenever someone tells me that, what I, ever, every, I always think th- there, Caesar is Lord. And if there isn't anything Caesar is Lord over that doesn't cover my politics, Jesus can be Lord of that. It doesn't work that way. Christianity is inviting Jesus into your life and he becomes your primary association. You're a Christian first and everything takes a back seat to that. And until we do that, then we're giving Caesar first chair in our lives. Now, let me just tell you, I've had the opportunity to meet two U.S. presidents, senators, Congress people, um, and by the way, both sides of the aisle, and they have all been very nice um, as I've met them. And I, I remember, I'll tell you one story that um, back in 2016, it was an election year, and um, I got a phone call from former President Clinton's office that he was doing a meeting here in Miramar and asked if I would go. And, um, and listen, I have a certain thing like, if the president calls you, you go. That's just my certain thing. And you might disagree with that, and I will learn to live with your disappointment. Um, but that's just my thing. Like, if the president calls you, you just go, right? So anyway, um, and so I went, and I, I get to this meeting. It's maybe, maybe 50 people, all pastors. And uh, President Clinton spoke for like 30 minutes. And then afterwards, I was able to talk to him for about 10 minutes. I took a picture with him. Um, I think where the mistake was, is that I thought it would be funny if I just posted a picture on Instagram and I just wrote, um, you know, I don't know what you did today, um, but I hung out with the former leader of the free world. And um, yeah, you know how people are super reasonable online? <laughs> um, <laughs> people went insane. And, um, and, and they, th- you know, and I mean, you know, we had some people that were like, I'm never going back to Calvary uh, for, you know, I can't believe you voted for that guy and, and whatever. I didn't vote for that guy. Um, either time. I voted for Ross Perot, by the way. The first time I ever voted, 92, I voted for Ross Perot. You know why? Because he said he was going to abolish the IRS. That's why I voted for him. And by the way, if you run and say you'll abolish the IRS, I will vote for you. All right? So, um, but I'll tell you this. I mean, people went nuts. My dad, one of my favorite voicemails I ever got from my dad was over this because I posted that picture and my dad, um, you know, my dad doesn't own a computer. And so he's getting called like, did you see what Robert did? And um, you see who he's hanging out with? <laughs> As if I'm with like a, well, I can't really say that. Uh, and so anyway, um, so anyway, my dad calls me and he, I was, I'm in a meeting, so he leaves me a message. And, uh, and he says, Robertico, hay problema en la familia. Llámame. And so that was it. That was the message. Robert, there's trouble in the family. Call me. And, uh, and so then he calls me. I call him back. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, Rodrigo, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, do you understand how many phone calls I'm getting um, about you from, from everyone about the, uh, I guess you posted a picture on the internet? And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and so once he doesn't understand things. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, what are you doing? Now you got to understand, my dad is like the most conservative person in the world. And, um, and I'm like, Papa, I understand what you're saying, but the president called me. If the president called you and said, Mr. Frank was, we need you. Your country needs you. Come to this meeting. Would you go? And he, and, and <laughs> I forget my dad's answer. He's like, okay. Hey, it was like, it was the most Tony Montana answer I've ever given. Okay. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Look, pelicans. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> I think that's the first time in 24 years I've ever actually quoted Scarface uh, in church. Don't watch that movie, kids. Very bad. Very bad. Anyway, everybody was okay after that, and no one was hurt in the making of that picture. By the way, let me tell you something. I get uh, requests, and um, especially in a year like this, we will get emails and calls um, from politicians who uh, I love. You know, I've never had a politician, ever, and we've had many of them come to services, and um, they have always announced that they're coming before they get there, they, before they get here. Hey, we just want you to know we're going to be worshiping at Calvary. I'm like, great. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure there's a seat open for you. And they're like, but you know, if you want to just acknowledge that we're here, or even maybe give us a minute to, you know, talk to the congregation and encourage them. <laughs> encourage them to do what, sir? Um, and so, anyway, and, uh, and, and by the way, it's not, they don't call, come here because I'm special. They come here because they want access to all of you. And, um, and I'll tell you what I've told every politician who's wanted to stand behind this pulpit for the last 24 years. Sorry, but no, Caesar is not Lord here. Jesus is Lord here. So, yeah. 
And people got to stop busting my chops about the picture, all right? I'm just like, come on, man. Now, <laughs> and now I'm going to announce my candidacy. And anyway, no, that has got to be the worst job ever, by the way. I mean, I would rather do anything than that. Okay, verse 23 says that Paul spoke from morning until evening, reasoning with these Jewish leaders about the Messiah. And what's amazing to me, it says that some were persuaded. Some people believed. And others were dissuaded. And so they were becoming a little more antagonistic. And then Paul says, look, I'm going to give you this one thing I want you to think about. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, which is a really powerful passage. The first uh, half of, the chap uh, of Isaiah 6 is when Isaiah receives his call to ministry. And, 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 and God says, you know, who's going to go? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then God tells him the mission of Isaiah. And he's like, look, I want you to go, but just know this, that you're going to speak. Um, the, people are going to see but not perceive. They're going to hear but not understand. You're going to speak it to them, but they're not going to perceive it in their hearts. Why? Because their hearts are hard. Paul shares that passage that we read a moment ago, and he's like, don't be like your ancestors who heard the words of God from the prophets and didn't believe. And that's why the whole scene ends with them arguing among themselves. So, Let's, um, I left two verses, so let's um, read the last two verses and close the book of Acts together. It says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now, Paul spends two years essentially on house arrest, waiting for his day in court to stand trial before Caesar Nero, but it wasn't wasted time. It wasn't wasted time at all. Paul was preaching the kingdom of God. So what I want to do as we close, I just want to tell you three things real quick, three final insights from the book of Acts that should impact us. The first is this, that your home matters. Your home matters. Paul used the home that he was in as his base of operations for the kingdom of God. And this, of course, in our context, begins with our spouse, it begins with our kids, it begins with our family, but it also means that you could open your home for a growth group, you could open your home for it to be a place where people draw close to Jesus. And I can tell you this, I really cut my teeth in regards to teaching, um, was Carrie and I, when we had been married for just three or four months, we decided to start a small group in our church, and um, we, we opened up our little one-bedroom apartment for uh, college students on Sunday afternoon, and it was an amazing experience. So your home matters. Number two, your circumstance matters. Paul being imprisoned put people in front of him that he wouldn't have met otherwise. And you know what else it did? It activated others to preach. Paul says in Philippians, talking about this whole situation, he says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Other people started preaching. There were Roman soldiers who were in charge of Paul that heard the gospel and believed. In fact, at the very end of the, the book of Philippians, in chapter 4, verse 22, he says, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That there was this revival that was taking place within the household of Caesar and within the Roman military there in Rome because Paul was preaching. Now, let me tell you a story about a famous preacher in American history named Jonathan Edwards. Um, he preached probably the most famous sermon in American history that was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that sermon kicked off what was called the First Great Awakening in Britain and in the American colonies. From about 1730 to 1740, there was a revival that, uh, in America that the colonies had never seen uh, since they had, people had come over and landed on Plymouth Rock a little over 100 years before. Um, Jonathan Edwards was at the center of it. Another preacher whose name was George Whitfield, who Benjamin Franklin said was the greatest preacher he had ever heard, uh, was at the center of it. They were preaching to thousands of people at once. Um, but Edwards was at the center of it. Then, about 10 years later in 1750, there was some silly church politics that got Edwards kicked out of his church in Massachusetts. And um, after he left the church, he found himself... Uh, he became the president of Princeton University, which was a, cemetery, uh, a, a seminary at the time, not the hot mess that it is now. Um, but uh, by the way, if you're a fan of the Hamilton play, uh, the person that Edwards succeeded as president uh, was Aaron Burr Sr., uh, the, the, son, uh, the father of Aaron Burr, who uh, killed Alexander Hamilton. Spoiler alert, by the way. Um, 
And uh, by the way, so in, in, the so in the song, Wait For It, when he says, my mother was a genius, my father commanded respect, it's because his father was the president of uh, Princeton University, Princeton Seminary. Anyway, here's why this matters. Because almost all, almost all of the writing that we have of Edwards 300, la 300 years later came when he was at Princeton. And those writings have become his greatest gift to the church. Um, was getting kicked out of his church in Massachusetts painful? Yes. But God was ultimately setting Edwards up to impact Christians for the next 300 years. And here's why I bring this up. Because during the two years that Paul is under house arrest, he will write the book of Philippians. He will write his letter to the Ephesians. He will write his letter to the Colossians. And he will write his letter to Philemon. The greatest gift that Paul gave the church was not his preaching as awesome as it was. The greatest gift that Paul gave the church was not his ability to plant churches, which was formidable. Paul's greatest gift to the church were those 13 letters, and if you count Hebrews 14, that were preserved in the New Testament, and four of those were written from this house. Every time you and I read those letters and we're blessed by them, just remember that Paul was in prison when he was writing those words. And the truth is, sometimes we think that our circumstance is what dictates everything. I, 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 I disagree. Instead, Sometimes the only way to write Philippians, which is an epistle about how to have joy no matter your circumstance, is by writing it from house arrest in Rome. So don't let your circumstances dictate what you do. Instead, realize that sometimes there's a hidden purpose for what God is doing that's going to propel the mission and what God has for you because your life isn't out of control and your circumstances have not taken God by surprise. Last thing I want to tell you and then we're done. Number three, your life matters. You know what the most common thing that people say when um, they read the book of Acts for the first time? They say, well, what happened to Paul? Did it all work out? And why does the book set, uh, end so abruptly? And I, I, I want to know more. Now, um, let, me, let me answer the first question. What happened to Paul? Did it all work out? Church, um, the scriptures don't tell us, but um, according to church history, uh, uh, there was a, an early church father named Eusebius who was a third century uh, Christian leader. Um, and Clement, who was the Bishop of Rome in uh, the end of the first century, um, they both record that Paul was released, that he had his meeting with the emperor. The emperor said, there's really no reason to charge you, and he released Paul. Um, and that Paul was free for possibly a year or two. Clement wrote that Paul traveled to the farthest limits of the West, which he meant to be Spain. Uh, which Paul says in Romans 15 that he wanted to travel to. There's another ancient document uh, called the Muratorian Canon that says that Paul went from Rome to Spain right after his release from prison. There's a lot of other things that Paul could have done. What we do know is that sometime after Paul's release from prison, after his time in Spain, he comes back and ends up in the city of Troas. Now, uh, this is around 64, 65 A.D., Troas, if you remember, in chapter, all the way back in chapter 16 of the book of Acts, Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia that says, come help us. And so then, um, and that's why Paul ends up going to Macedonia and Greece and Corinth, the, all that area. He goes because he receives that vision. He's back in Troas, and th at this moment is when he is rearrested. But this time he's rearrested, and the reason is, in 64 A.D., uh, Caesar Nero sets fire to the city of Rome in order to rebuild it the way he wants. And so the people, are, the people of Rome are so mad. And so he decides, instead of owning up to it, he says that it was the Christians who started the fire. So he starts rounding up all the Christian leaders. And um, he rounds up Paul. Later, he rounds up Peter. And then Paul is not taken to house arrest this time. He's taken to what's called the Mamertine prison. The Mamertine prison, it still exists today in Rome. It is a hole in the ground with no water, no sanitation, and no limit on how many people you could put there. It's at this moment that Paul writes 2 Timothy uh, to say goodbye to his son in the faith. Uh, then later, Paul is uh, taken out of the Mamertine prison and taken to a street in Rome that's called the Apian Way. He has read his death sentence, and then he's beheaded for his faith. Um, at that moment, Paul went from the imperial city to the eternal city and heard the words that believers long to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll now make you ruler over many things. Um, the Apostle Paul was a man of whom the world was not worthy. And it is amazing to me 
that the man who hated Christians so much had an experience, an encounter with Jesus, and somehow became the best of us. And my friends, if that is not the essence of the gospel, I don't know what is. So why does the book of Acts end this way? It just seems so abrupt. Well, remember, the theme of the book of Acts is how the gospel goes from Jerusalem and makes its way to uh, the imperial city of Rome. And Luke accomplishes that. But here's the other reason why it ends seemingly abruptly. Because Paul's story, for Luke's purposes, ends in um, Acts 28. But Acts 29 is you and me. It's our turn to take the gospel to the places where it needs to go and the people who need it. You see, the book of Acts is the book that doesn't end because it lives on in you and me and us. If you remember 11 months ago, in our very first message in Acts, I said this, that the book is called the Acts of the Apostles, but it really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles because it's the Spirit of God that was empowering everything that we saw. And my friends, the Spirit of God is not done working. This generation needs its Apostle Paul, its Barnabas, it's Timothy, it's Aquila, it's Priscilla, it's Dr. Luke, and it's all of us serving, sacrificing, and living a life that matters for the kingdom of God. So I thought, um, as a way to not just close this message, but to close the last 11 months that we've spent together, is to maybe share some of Paul's final words uh, that he wrote before, um, when he was in the Mamertine prison before um, his ministry on earth came to an end. And he says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing the end. Let's pray together. And Lord, we are really, we're so grateful. We're grateful that you can take people like Peter, who was always saying the wrong thing and make him such a powerful preacher. That you could take the Apostle Paul, who hated your people so much, and make him the champion of the gospel in his generation. Lord, if you can take these people and turn them into giants, then certainly you can do that work with us. So Lord, I pray. I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, do your incredible work in us and through us and for us because you love us. And Lord, may eternity be different. May this world be different because we took your word seriously. And we pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488 and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called BEGIN written by Pastor Bob and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at my Calvary on Instagram and Facebook. Until next week, we love you. We're praying for you. God bless you.